Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that knows that the only thing cooler than being cool is ice cold. He is the captain. Yeah, and I know you think your shit don't stink, but lean a little closer. Roses really smell like poo poo oo. It's good to be seen. It's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week we are featuring Quilter's Irish Death by Iron Horse Brewery. This is a fantastic Halloween beer. This is a dark, smooth ale that Iron Horse lovingly refers to as beer candy. ABV, 7.8%, garage grade, four and a quarter bottle caps out of five. And this week's beer was brought to us by these little trick-or-treaters right here. First up, we have Jenny in San Mateo, California. And a big we like your jib to Jessica in Bria, Kentucky. Next, we have Linda Lawrence, who is pitching in on the beer fund every month. So a big thank you to you, Linda. And a big shout out to Robert in South San Francisco. Next, we have Courtney, who says she's working the corner down in Jonesboro, Tennessee. And next, we have Laura in Rensselaer. I hope I said that right. That's right in there in uh, New York. And last but certainly not least, a big happy Halloween. A big thank you for all that you do to Aurelia down in Florida. Aurelia is a longtime friend of our show. In fact, she was... <laughs> our she first was, friend. She was the first friend of the show. So yeah. so cheers to her and cheers to all my homies that went to truecrimegarage.com and contributed to this week's beer fund. And Captain, everybody knows that they can follow us on social media. So follow the Crispy Colonel on Untapped. And everybody knows that we have shirts and awesome merch on our store page. Buy a damn shirt, people. <laughs> at the website. So that is enough of the business. All right, everybody. Grab your chair. Grab your beer. Let's talk some true crime. Arroyo Grande, California. On Sunday, July 23rd, 1995, the parents of 15-year-old Elise Pauler reported her missing to the San Luis Obispo Sheriff's Department. Her parents, David and Lisa Ann, reported that the teen was last seen at her family's home when she left for unknown reasons. Elise was described as 5 feet 7 inches tall and about 120 pounds. She is Caucasian with shoulder-length blonde hair and blue eyes. In the coming weeks and months, the local TV news and newspapers will remind the public of the missing teen, adding that family and friends had not seen nor heard from Elise since the night of July 22nd. The Sheriff's Department stated that they are attempting to locate the teen, but say that they have no leads. There were several unconfirmed sightings of Elise. Again, these are unconfirmed. The Sheriff's Department theorized she is still in the area, possibly in South San Luis Obispo County area. As Christmas approached, a tip came in. The tipster stated that Elise was alive and traveling with a carnival in Colorado. This tip included a ray of hope. The caller said Elise might call home on Christmas Day. December 25th, 1995, Christmas Day. The Pauler family gathered as usual for a big traditional Christmas dinner. Loved ones had presents under the tree for Elise. They waited all day for the telephone to ring, bringing them the message they had hoped and prayed for, for months. A call home from Elise, saying she was all right and she was no longer missing. That call never came. In January of 1996, after Elise was missing for over five months now, her grandmother Elise, whose grandkids called her Nana, made a public plea for her granddaughter to return home or at least to reach out and communicate with her family. In a letter released in several newspapers, Nana addressed the letter to my dearest Elise, writing, I miss you and I love you. Everyone is very worried and heartbroken because we don't know how you are, if you are happy, warm, well-fed, and healthy. In closing, Nana writes, We can work it out. You can stay here with me until you want to go elsewhere. Please, please, just call me so we know you are alive. A 
Elise Pollard was born April 24th, 1980 to parents David and Lisa Ann. She would be the oldest of four children. Her siblings are sisters Jennifer and Christina and her brother Ryan. This was a happy, big family who loved one another and looked after each other. The family was active in their church and in their community. Elise excelled at a very early age at painting, and she was said to be a very gifted person in the arts. This would continue throughout her life. And in 1992, at the age of 12, Elise finished first and took the girls' beginner's title at the Nipomo Tennis Association's Junior Singles Tournament. In the summer of 1995, Elise was maturing, now age 15 hanging out with other high school kids. Of course, and like most situations, Elise's parents knew most of Elise's friends and schoolmates, but not all of them. As we said in the trailer, Elise was last seen at her home on the night of July 22nd, reported missing the next morning by her parents. The early reports state that Elise left home for unknown reasons, and then she was missing for days, weeks, and then months. As we almost always see in these cases, the parents of the missing teenager in the sheriff's department have differing opinions and theories as to what exactly has taken place. The parents always fear the absolute worst, and law enforcement has to look at the known facts of the situation and any possible leads and let those circumstances lead their theories and opinions. Some more detailed information would eventually come out in this case. And I think from this story and the information that comes out, you can possibly see why there was a difference in opinion here. The story that comes out, and this is from Elise's grandmother, Elise Walter, and it was reported in the Santa Maria Times newspaper. And the report says, the night she disappeared, Elise had been watching a movie with her family when she received a telephone call from a friend At about 10 p.m., Walter said. When Elise received a second phone call a few minutes later, Walter said she abruptly told her parents she was tired and was going to bed. She said, I love you and I'm going to bed. The phone call, Walter said, was from a boy who had been suspended from Arroyo Grande High School in March of 1995 after Elise told officials the boy had sold drugs. Though her father checked To make sure Elise was okay after she went to bed, a second check by one of Elise's two sisters a short time later found pillows had been stuffed under the blankets to make it appear that Elise was present. Walter, who has spent the past eight months searching for clues to the whereabouts of her granddaughter, said Elise had snuck out of the house a few times prior to her disappearance, but had always returned the next day by dawn. When she didn't return home by the morning of July 23rd, Elise's father called the sheriff's department. So this is where I think we're seeing the difference of opinions as far as the sheriff's department is concerned and her family is concerned. Right. The family is concerned because there are two phone calls that they are aware of that came into the house just before she may have left on her own. You know, everybody knows the old trick we've seen it in the prison escape movies we've seen kids do it in movies where you stuff a couple pillows or stuffed animals underneath the the sheets or blankets to appear that somebody's sleeping in the bed but the family is concerned about the phone calls and that she didn't come home the sheriff's department on the other end they're concerned about a couple of things one it appears that elise left the home on her own Right. To go off and do what, we don't know. But it appears that she left on her own. Two, it's already reported that, that she has left the home several times before, snuck out in the middle of the night. She was, as her parents say and grandmother says, running around with, the, with a bad crowd at that time in her life. Mm-hmm. And we have these unconfirmed sightings of her elsewhere. So police are looking at this going, well, she might have snuck out in the middle of the night. She This time she may have just run away. And now we're seeing, we have these sightings of her elsewhere. Now, the, the only issue I take with that is a 15-year-old blonde high school kid right. 
I mean, the, the dime a dozen, right? It, it would be easy to to believe that you are seeing her somewhere, and these are, as said, unconfirmed sightings. No, and there's a, there's a lot of reports that she had a French door. She she lived in a pretty big house, and she was not as close to the other rooms. Okay, and for whatever reason, they keep. And almost every report I read, they talk about how that she had French doors. Um, note to anybody that has French doors, they're the easiest doors to break into. Please. They're also the easiest to sneak out of. Are they? Well, I <laughs> I don't know. My home growing up, what, well, one of the homes that I grew up in, I don't know if it was the location of the of the door itself, but or if, or if the French door was just quieter when it would open and close, but... That was my door of choice for sneaking out, was the French door. Yeah, so just a safety note, if you have French doors, make sure that you have some other um, locking system on them than what comes with them. Mm -hmm. I also think, um, as far as the family goes with their gut feeling when she's missing and the fact that they think that she is no longer with them, I I believe that is coming from some kind of... um, maternal instinct, uh, some gut feeling, maybe not so much evidence, but also as parents and as law enforcement, you have to go, well, what are these calls Mm -hmm. and what is the motivation? Are these just calls that have nothing to do with the fact that she left the house or are are these uh, individuals that are going, hey, come hang out with us, come party with us? Is this a way to get her out of the house? So I don't know exactly what activities of Elise's that her parents would have been aware of, you know, what she was up to when she was not at home. But it seems to me that the big question mark and red flag that I have here is when we said law enforcement has to follow the leads, has to take the known information, the known facts, and come up with an opinion there, it it seems like the family has some general knowledge of the person that called the home. This doesn't seem to be like they're just like, oh, the phone rang twice and we don't she know spoke who to it somebody. Was, right. Because they're giving a little bit of a description of, of a, a boy who was suspended from school. We know that it was a boy. You have to wonder, did they in fact know the boy's name? Or how much information did they know about this person that called? And was it the same person that called twice that night or two separate people that called? Right. And if they did know this information, I'm, I'm assuming, given their fears that they stated early on, we were fearing the worst. Um, they were fearing that she was murdered. Even when we have these sightings come in, they still publicly stated that that was their fear. And you wonder... Again, I think that's just a gut feeling. Yeah, yeah. And we see this where parents fear the worst and law enforcement tries to keep a level head about it. Um, but but, what's but hold, on, the, hold on, hold on. Not ahead. always, because sometimes uh, law enforcement is going, look, we think there's foul play, and you have a mother or a father saying, hey, I, I think she's still with us. Because they're hopeful. Well, sometimes hopeful, but sometimes their gut feeling is telling them that their child is not uh, passed on. Right. You know, and, and you can't explain that. Now, I understand some of these sightings, because a lot of these sightings are like, very loosey goosey where they're saying we saw a a blonde girl matching the description of the missing teen at a convenience store or at a store in this area. And we're talking about these sightings are actually in the same County in which she was living. So this seems plausible. I don't, I don't know why. And I don't mean to laugh because this is a tragic story that we have to tell today. Oh, but But, you're an ass. But the, the, the story of, She's alive and traveling with a carnival in Colorado. Yeah. Uh, super bizarre, number one. And like when when I'm finding information and looking for information of this story and of this case, tracking down our own leads, I come across that and then I have to like double check the year of the story because I'm like, right. this was 1995, right? Let me double check that because that's something I would expect to hear right. like 1964, yeah, 1955. she ran away, joined the carnival. She joined the carnival. Well, there was also rumors too that she left to go to LA, right? Because she- To be a movie star. Yeah, she. I guess there were some rumors that she wanted to be an actress. Yeah, it's just so sad when you review this information and you even, 
if the parents or the family did not believe that there was a chance of this happening, it's still sad to read that on Christmas Day, there was some kind of hint of hope that they were going to receive a call from their missing daughter. Right. And of course we know that that day came and went without any communication from Elise to her family at all. Well, my frustration with this is the idea that the family is saying that we think our daughter has passed on. Now there's no evidence of that, but I also wonder if this is a tactic by law enforcement to go, Hey, there's no evidence that there's foul play. We're going to assume there's no foul play. And that, causes them to do less work in general or they believe some of the sightings that are coming in right the 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 troubling thing though is look her elisa's parents publicly state that they believe someone the caller the boy on the phone lured her out of the home that night and that the caller then is very likely the one responsible for why she never came home after that right And so they were very public about this. I mean, hell, we spent all of last week discussing a case where someone called the home of a youngster and lured her out of that home and into a a location where he could abduct her. The tricky thing here is your, your most hope is probably coming at Christmas time, even though she's already been missing for a few months. We know that that call, the call that they were hoping for, did not come in. And that is when really I feel that the panic truly set in, in this case, in big time for the family, because it's been months since anyone has last seen and now her, and now the hope is drying up. Her grandmother makes that very public plea on the news and in the newspapers in January of 1996. And we heard a portion of that letter in the trailer. Now I can't say for certain which theory the grandmother was going with because I'm sure she was on board with the family, but in that same letter, she praised the sheriff's department for all of their hard work. And maybe she believed some of the unconfirmed sightings out there as well. Yeah. Or possibly the rumor that she was going to call. And then once the call didn't happen, she thought, okay, well, if she's out there, I'm going to put this statement out there. If she's out there, she will make contact. Yeah. And we didn't read the entire letter written to her missing granddaughter, but But from top to bottom, it's a plea for Elise to call or to come home. Right. So other than these unconfirmed sightings and the rumors, there was really not a whole lot going on with this investigation. Unfortunately, there were, in in fact, no real leads in this thing, giving law enforcement almost nothing to work with. But this was a pretty safe area. Fairly. And you'll hear the people and read the people in the area talking about that area kind of changing during the 90s. There was a bad element to the area, let's say. Right. But almost when you thought nothing was going to happen with this investigation, that nothing was going to happen in the search for this young woman, something strange happened. This is on March 14th, 1996. So after 15-year-old Elise Pollard had gone missing, vanished into the night, was missing for months, a young man with dark brown hair flowing halfway down his back. He's a thin young man, 5 foot 10 inch frame. He walks into the sheriff's department and he has an almost unbelievable story to tell. This is 17-year-old Royce Casey. Royce said a couple of his friends knew the missing girl. Then Royce explained that he and those friends murdered Elise Poller. Now, uncertain if the boy was telling the truth, the detectives asked him if he knew where the girl's body was located. He said he did. They asked if he could take them to her. He said he could, and he did. Royce Casey led detectives to a rural area just a little more than a quarter of a mile from where Elise had lived. There, sure enough, just as the boy had said, they found a badly decomposed body. All right, we're back. Cheers, mates. 
Cheers to you, Captain. Happy Halloween to everybody out there. Yeah, make sure you check your candy. Make sure you steal some candy from your kids. If you want more True Crime Garage, we have a show that is on Stitcher Premium called Off the Record. You can find that by going to our website. Also, if you want some old episodes, if you want to hear how the captain sounded just as a little boy, Mm -hmm. you go and get the free Stitcher app and listen to all of our old episodes there. Started the show on a seven and a half. He was seven and a half and... Mm, Drinking beer in the garage. He had a very high-pitched voice. Mm. It's it's shameful. Sounds like Nick's voice now. (laughs) All right, Captain. Now, it would take a few days... But it would be on Monday, March 19th, 1996, that publicly identification of the body is announced to the public. And they do state that this was the missing girl. We have found 15-year-old Elise Pollard. Law enforcement during this time, while they're working to make that identification, one, they already believe that it is her because they have this teenager who has the story to tell that, that me and some friends killed this teenage girl. So they are in communication with Elise's family. And even before the identification was announced publicly, her father was in the paper stating they found Elise. Our fears were confirmed. Right. Um, but he also says too, that, there are going to be some details in this case that comes out. And when you hear them, you won't believe them. Mm -hmm. So he's getting detailed information from law enforcement before that it's put out publicly. He knows that once they get to an arraignment, when they have their first day in court to, to officially charge anyone with any type of crime, there will be some kind of details that come out that day and that the public is going to be shocked at what they hear. So he's aware of some of the confession, right? Let's call it that. Right. Some of my issue though, is she's found within a quarter mile of her house. Mm -hmm. You know, that it seems like they should have had some search parties or, or something. They should have found her body way before this. Yeah. So after the identification is made, the information that comes out now, mind you at first, the suspect or suspects will not be named publicly. In fact, the the boy that confessed, he's not named publicly for a couple of days as well. But what we end up learning is that 15-year-old Elise Pollard's body was discovered about a quarter mile from her home. She had been raped and murdered there, left there eight months earlier by acquaintances Jacob Delishmoot, Joseph Fiorella, and Royce Casey. The perpetrators apparently returned to the corpse and had sex with it on several occasions. The body was located after Royce Casey confessed to the crime following his conversion to Christianity. So Royce Casey, who had become estranged from his one-time friends Joseph and Jacob, he approached law enforcement officials and and admitted that he had helped kill the girl. He led authorities to her decomposed corpse which they found splayed out in a South County eucalyptus grove. So she wasn't far from home, but she was well concealed. The, the confession is going to have to offer up more details than just that, right? So what we would learn is that Roy states that the group got together and smoked some marijuana after which we have Delishmoot reportedly strangled Elise with his belt while Joseph Fiorella stabbed her in the neck with a hunting knife and Casey, Royce Casey, held her hands and arms. Then Casey and Delishmoot then took turns stabbing the girl. Right, I believe she was stabbed 12 times. You're exactly right. The forensic pathologist who examined the body testified later in court that none of the 12 stab wounds were in fact fatal, which indicated that Elise died by slowly bleeding to death. Right. Authorities said that the three had engaged in sexual intercourse with the girl's corpse. Investigators said Fiorella's mother told them her son said Royce and Casey had engaged in sex with the body. And one of Jacob's friends 
testified that he he bragged about returning to the corpse often saying to have sex with it. Yeah, I, I actually didn't believe this at at first, thinking oh, this is you know, this is a very sick crime. One to to kill anybody is a sick crime, but to then come back to the corpse and have sex with it that and you know let's you're raping the corpse, but to have three individuals do this that sounded unbelievable to me. But the fact that then you were telling me, well, no, it's be, we know for a fact that they kept coming back to the corpse, so that made it make more sense. Yeah, and, and the thing here too is. As you said, this this is weird, and it's weird to hear this. I mean, we know that when we covered Ted Bundy and, and some other cases as well, that even when Ted admitted to a lot of what he did, he was not upfront about the acts of necrophilia that he was doing. Right. And that's where you see a unique situation where these young men, they, they're bragging about probably the grossest, most disturbing part of this whole situation right but these are three disturbed individuals anyways disturbed individuals and young individuals right you know they the three youths all together apparently told at least two acquaintances of the murder itself but their tales were dismissed as a fabrication that these people they heard what these boys had to say you know friends of theirs or so-called friends of theirs right and they're like yeah we didn't tell anybody because we just thought these Idiots were lying. Right. It, it, the story, as said, sounded unbelievable. Apparently, though, Pollard's killing had been plotted once before. And this is according to Royce Casey. He tells law enforcement that not only did we kill her, but we attempted to do so on a previous um, occasion. Right. He said that on, on this one occasion, Joseph Fiorella and Jacob Delishmoot had tried to carry out this plan to kill Elise Pollard in this plot, which ended up being similar to the one that, that led to the girl's death. Casey told investigators, the trio enticed Pollard from her home and got her to walk to a spot on the Mesa where there was a steep ravine. And at this location, one of the boys pretended to slip down the ravine as a ruse to try to get, Elise Pollard to walk down to the bottom of this ravine. Right now, apparently she didn't do what they needed her to do for this plot to be carried out. But even so Joseph Fiorella then pulls out a knife. He tosses it to, this is another individual that actually was not involved in the killing of Elise Pollard. Mm -hmm. But this knife that, that Joseph Fiorella pulls out, on this occasion ends up being the same one that would later be used in her murder. Right now, the other teen, remember he throws this knife to this other guy, that other teen, he kind of panics and he just stood there. He didn't, he didn't do anything. And the other teen boys are shouting out, do it, do it. You know, they're trying to get him to initiate the attack on a lease. He does not do it. And Casey Royce Casey tells law enforcement, this sounds weird that we're telling you the story of, of, you know, another, a failed attempt, I guess, right. at her murder. Well, then why would she leave the house and go out with you? And he told law enforcement, he goes, it, she probably just thought we were goofing around. Right. She didn't, she wasn't aware. We didn't state what we intended to do that day. She didn't really believe that there was any threat there. These are teenagers getting high and acting like goofballs. And she probably just assumed that they were just, idiots and they were goofing around well and these idiots were part of a band right the band was called hatred yeah which which gives you an idea of <laughs> of uh, what kind of music they were playing and probably at what um at what talent level they were probably playing this well, music yeah i think it's funny i heard a couple people uh when reporting on this say i think that's a good band name i think it's a shitty band name but that's just my Hatred, we're called. That it sounds like a very ten year old, twelve year old, we're gonna join a metal band. What are you gonna call it? Hatred. 
Well, um, and what I couldn't figure out, Captain, what I was trying to find was how legit was this band, right? Because when right. you're in high school, everybody knows somebody that's always forming a band that never forms. That doesn't <laughs> ever practice. They yeah. never practice. They don't have any real music. Half of the people that are supposed to be in this band don't have any instruments or equipment. But I guess based off the confession, he he did say uh, that during some rehearsals, I believe, or during some practices, or again, that it could not be a practice. It could just be hanging out at somebody's house and one guy has a guitar there. Because um, I've had, you know, back in my day, I've had band practices like that. Mm -hmm. Hey, we're going to go over to jam and you show up and there's one guy with a guitar. Right. Um, but that's kind of where, you know, this obsession with her kind of began or how he heard about it anyways. Yeah. And the whole band thing is important to this case for several reasons. Look, Joseph Fiorella was 16 years old. Royce Casey was 18 and Jacob Delishmoot was 17. The state wanted to try them as adults for their roles in the killing and right. for the acts that they carried out afterwards. And the important thing here for the state is they need to present this to the public and say, look, this is how disturbed and this is how messed up these kids are. They're, they're super violent. We don't want them on the streets ever again because of what we know about this murder and these crimes. It's not yeah. safe for anybody, for, for any of these three to be walking around out in society. Yeah, I mean, this is a premeditated murder. Again, this is a this is a torturous murder. Then, then the torture to the corpse afterwards. I mean, this is beyond heinous. So the state puts forward to the public some of the details about the crimes, stating that the defendants said that they needed to commit a sacrifice to the devil to give their heavy metal band hatred the craziness to go professional. Apparently part of their part of the, the plea here will be a full confession where you're going to hear, in my opinion, what would be several motives for this murder. And one of it being that they wanted to sacrifice a virgin to the devil to make their band play better, to make them get a contract to make them be a, a big band. And one of the bands that they idolized was the band Slayer. Right. And anybody that's familiar with their music, you know what you're getting into. And I don't want to, this is not going to turn into an old man rant here because as the captain will, will vouch for me on, I, I grew up a, a big fan of what We've you seen would call a lot of metal bands, a lot of, what you would call death metal. Um, I yeah. was never into Slayer. But um, they're, they're I one certainly of the big four though, right? Metallica. Yeah, Megadeth, I mean, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to disrespect anybody. I never considered them one of the big four. Mm -hmm. I almost feel like because of the tragedy with Pantera, that that Slayer may have got elevated, right, to the right. big four. Also, when you're putting together that tour, you got to line up whoever's willing to go, and by default, somebody may become part of the big four. I don't think anybody would argue that the other three are the big three. Right. right. So, well, and look, if you offer 10 times that I get to see Pantera or Slayer, 10 out of 10 times, I'm going to go see Pantera. Oh, 100%. Unfortunately, another detail to the confession was that Elise Pollard cried out for her mother when she was attacked and she was on the ground praying to God and calling for her mom, and these savages just continued to attack her anyway. Yeah, and I think this is, some of it is, you know, the the crossroads story. Mm -hmm. Robert Johnson goes to the crossroad, meets the devil, signs his soul away, and, and supposedly these guys were talking in, in chat rooms about this, and these, I guess they were like, satanic or occult chat rooms and the people of the chat rooms were saying well look if you if you sacrifice somebody then you could have these powers so you have that going on plus they're they're in a shitty band and they're shitty musicians and they're shitty people all around as pieces of shit 
Well, and you know what was weird too was I couldn't find anybody that said that they had ever seen the band play anywhere. Like there were some other teenagers that seemed to be aware of this band. Right. Probably just hearing these boys talk about it and boast about it. We we already know that when it comes to murder and other sick acts that these three certainly had no filter. They were too young and too dumb to not keep quiet about what they had done. Right. Um so with the with the band thing, who knows if it was even the real deal or not. But yeah. we do know that that was what the claims were. The the public claims were that they wanted to sacrifice a virgin to earn them a ticket to hell and to become this big band. Now, the representation for one of these boys would state that a lot of this, a lot of these allegations were grossly overstated and some of them were flatly without any factual support right. stating these allegations are intended to inflame public opinion. Again, we need these three guys to be tried as adults. And fortunately that's what takes place. All three of these 16, 17 year old, 18 year old, they're going to be tried as adults for their roles in the killing. And eventually all three of them would plead no contest to her murder. Right. And this was, this was not an easy or short court proceedings, but what it led to was a plea of no contest to her murder, and all three of them are imprisoned and serving 26 years to life for each one of these. So hopefully but, uh, none of these look, three I'm, get out of prison, right. but there is that option that could happen. I, I'm not clear, though. So we get the one guy that confesses. Yeah. What was his name again? Sorry. Um, Royce the, Casey. Yeah, he's the main guy in this case. He comes forward. He confesses. But it seems like the other two then confess. I just want to be clear about that. Did they end up confessing as well? It, I mean, it appears that way, right? It appears that way, but what we do know is that they pled no contest. Right. So they're not going to fight the charges basically. And Royce Casey, he comes forward because he converted to Christianity. He right. he saw the light, found God. So he's and, hanging out with these numb nuts, right? And they're doing stuff, satanic stuff, occultist stuff, and then they're they're listening to the this death metal music and then they decide and one of the members is, has this obsession with her. And so therefore we're going to lure her out of her home at night and we're going to kill her have sex with the body and then one of them at some point I, I i don't think it's as simple as that he just found christianity i also think he was convinced that the other two were going to kill again and possibly kill him so i, I don't think it's as simple as look i found god and look at me i'm, I, I'm the righteous one i'm the one confessing i think part of this was to save his own ass. It could be. I mean, I can't say what's going on in the, the mind of Royce Casey, but what has been reported is that he, he found God and he wanted to own up to what he was a part of. Um, he, now we might just be getting his version of the events, but as you stated, they, they pled no contest. We would get public statements from the other two eventually that would make it sound as though they've confessed on some level uh-huh elisa's parents david and lisa ann pauler they would later claim that the slayer songs post-mortem and dead skin mask from the albums rain and blood and seasons in the abyss gave the three killers detailed instructions to stalk rape torture and commit acts of necrophilia right so this is a lawsuit that is filed and technically it was filed twice now, both times the lawsuit was thrown out. Jacob Delishmu himself stated in a Washington Post interview, quote, the music is destructive, but that's not why Elise was murdered. She was murdered because Joe Fiorella was obsessed with her and obsessed with killing her. Right. We do know that David Pauler stated to the newspaper shortly after the arrest of the three young men that he believed that his daughter was being stalked by these three boys. They were, in fact, acquaintances. And what little he knew about these boys, he could say at one time, 
Elise rode the same school bus as two of the three. Now, we have a situation where these three boys are, they're living a different life than what Elise was. And we do know that she might have been running around with the wrong crowd at that time, just being 15 years old. But one of these boys, in fact, attended a different school, was was a member at a private school. Right. The other two boys rode the same bus as Elise, and it was these two boys that her father, David, believed were stalking her. They were um, maybe obsessed with her. We don't know what level of friendship or relationship that they had, but the two boys that rode the school bus with her at one point, they were certainly in and out of trouble leading up to this. At the time of her murder, neither of those boys were still attending that same school because they had gotten so much trouble that they were told they had to leave. Right. One of them, I believe, was already enrolled in another school somewhat in the area, and then the other boy was attending homeschool. Well, on top of just playing in the band and being kicked out of school, uh, these kids had some drug use as well. Correct. Correct. They were selling drugs, and I don't know what drugs they were pushing, but we do know at the very least that they used marijuana to lure her out of her home that night to go and well, hang out with these guys. Well, I think they were doing guys. opioids. And, or no, not opioids, uh, amphetamines. Well, and that's where I referenced the bad element in the area. There were several people that after this confession and after these men were put away that stated hey, you know, marijuana is one thing, but we were seeing opioids, amphetamines, we were seeing uh, crack and crystal meth right. being introduced to the area and, and people, a lot of people partaking in those activities. And I understand why the parents sued Slayer or why they tried to sue Slayer mm -hmm. because especially this story, it seems like all all the individuals were saying, well, we all listen to Slayer, and and that might be a part of the equation. You get these idiot kids. One's obsessed with this girl. They're going into these chat rooms. I think on some level, maybe these chat rooms are a little more responsible, you know, than than a Slayer record would be. Mm -hmm. But I also believe in freedom of speech, and I also believe in capitalism. And, and if you have a band singing songs about shitty things that, you know, you want, if people don't listen to it, it eventually goes away. Mm -hmm. So, so I do think that's on, um, you know, their parents on some level, um, you know, it, it, and you're always going to have that argument while well, these people were playing video games and those games caused them to kill. No, I think deep down you're a piece of shit and that's what caused you to do what you did not not because you listened to a slayer record yeah i'm i'm fully on board with the the lawsuit itself on both occasions because what i'm going to attempt to understand here is that when my daughter is taken and killed and murdered i i will attempt to understand just being angry at everybody and right. wanting to hold everybody responsible I'm fully on board with that. The other thing too is that this isn't something that the investigators just made up. Oh, these boys were listening to Slayer and they and they killed this girl. This isn't something that they made up. This was part of the confession. And so therefore I get that and I understand that from the parents' perspective. I would be upset with everyone as well and wanting to hold as many people accountable as possible as well, given the situation. Yeah. But it's, but it's, as you said, it's, you can't, you can't hold a band like Slayer or some other band accountable for this because it's just not, it's just not fair and it doesn't work for society. I mean, what are you going to do? Take every movie, video game, book, everything right. out there that maybe ever molded these boys into who they turned out to be and and make them pay grievances it just it doesn't work i i get it but um and i i don't fault the parents for pursuing those avenues but i also fully understand why it was thrown out yeah and i also wonder if some of this stuff was blown up this is towards the end of the 80s 
So you got some satanic panic stuff going on. And I wonder if some of these, like we were talking about before, if, you know, these darky dudes are sitting there going, well, yeah, we're in this metal band called Hatred. And yeah, we're like really influenced by Slayer. If a comment like that is just kind of blown up even more. And I know there's more comments than just that, but I think some of this stuff is kind of blown up. But but I think those chat rooms, I really think like if... if those accounts are true and they're in these chat rooms and you have these adults in these chat rooms saying, well, yeah, if you, you know, if you want to get these powers and you want to, um, get signed to a major label, if you want to, uh, sell your soul to the devil, what you need to do is sacrifice somebody. And, and I think the combination of that and these kids on amphetamines and all these other mind altering drugs that we, we know, look again, there's a lot of people that are like, there's nothing wrong with booze. I mean, our show, we talk about booze. There's not nothing wrong with weed. A lot of these things are not suitable for growing minds. Right. And and they shouldn't be, they shouldn't be partaked in until, you know, early twenties or whatever. So I'm sure there's some science on that. I'm, I'm not a science. I'm just a scientist. I'm just a captain of a lonely ship. No, but I think it's the combination of that. But if you have these idiot assholes in chat rooms going, Oh yeah, you should sacrifice somebody that would get you signed. Um, I don't know if you'd ever be able to find those individuals, but, but those individuals are pieces of shit. Yeah. Uh, Elisa Pollard's story was the basis of, for part of the storyline in the 2009 film Jennifer's Body, which starred Megan Fox, I've not seen the movie, so I don't, I can't, can't back that up. Right. But that is what is often reported in this. The, you know, these situations, of course, they have lasting effects and, and horrific effects on the loved ones and parents of a murdered teenager. But there was a story that came out years after her death where Elisa's father, David was involved in a road rage incident. And he cited that he has PTSD from living through this situation and claimed that he has difficulty managing stress, difficulty managing his anger levels and actions at times because of how much he, he suffered and was hurt by this whole tragic, um, story well no and that's the thing that i think a lot of people wrestle with if if this was my sister what would i what would i've done if i heard rumors about these three individuals stabbing her 12 times letting her bleed out then going back and and messing with the body like i mean this this is a gruesome crime. Uh, that's not to take away, you know, from other crimes, but it's like, there's, it's like, if you're confronted with that individual, would you take their life? And so you have this father, I think in a lot of these cases, fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, family members that feel like, they didn't do anything wrong, but they didn't do anything right. If that makes sense. Like, there's probably nothing that her parents could have done differently that day. Like, these kids called her and somehow they got her out of the house. And there's probably nothing that they could have said before she went to bed to change that. But there's not a day that probably goes by in his brain that he doesn't think, well, what if I hugged her goodnight? Maybe she wouldn't have left the house. Maybe if I would have done this, that that I could have stopped this on some level. And yeah, you'd be, I think it would be almost impossible to let go of that anger. And another strange twist in this story here, Captain, we have Anthony Fiorella, the brother of Joseph Fiorella. He killed a teenager as well. This took place in 1998 when he shot and killed a teenager by the name of Garrett Hunter. Now, this was over a drug dispute. He was there to sell 
some drugs and it this was a drug deal gone bad gone wrong and anthony fiorella killed this other young man now in regards to the three individuals that murdered their daughter elise Pollard, the Pollard family stated we want these predatory monsters to stay in prison for the rest of their lives and we couldn't agree more All right. Happy Halloween and cheers, mates. Thanks so much for joining us this week in the garage. Yeah, everybody make sure you have a safe and happy Halloween. Want to throw out a quick recommendation before we wrap up for this week here, Captain. This week we are recommending Call Me God. This is the untold story of the DC sniper investigation. Last week, Audible presented this and it came out on Thursday. And I downloaded it, and I cannot quit listening to it. I would not call this an audio book. This is more of a presentation. So check out Call Me God, and we will have that title listed for you on our recommended page at truecrimegarage.com. Yeah, like the colonel said, be safe. Make sure you check your kids' candy, and make sure you steal a couple pieces for yourself. But be safe and enjoy this week. And until next week, be good, be kind, and don't litter. Don't litter.